When we sat down to think about, you know, Sarah, again, and I, we watched, we drank tea, we watched the documentary and we're like, okay, how are we going to approach this? What, what do educators really need? What should we do with these stories? And we thought, well, you know, for the teachers, we have to make sure that what we do is really flexible. Um, because school looks a lot different right now than it used to look, certainly. And we knew that if this was going to work, it had to work for a variety of formats. It had to work for um, uh, remote only. And we also knew that this couldn't be just one more thing for teachers to figure out. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure that we made something for teachers who really wanted to do a lot of facilitation with the materials, as well as teachers who honestly don't have enough time to do the facilitation. So we wanted it to work either way because some teachers need just enrichment materials or supplementary materials for some students in the class so that they can work more intensely with other students in the class. So we, we flexibility, flexibility RS, that was one of our big mantras. We put it on a sticky note and made sure that that guided our approach. The other thing is we wanted this to be ridiculously easy to assign. We wanted teachers to be able to get a URL, a web address, and copy and paste that into however you assign work, whether it's email or some schools have a learning management system like Google Classroom or Schoology or whatever you're using to assign things, but it's just a URL. You say students complete this, it'll take you roughly an hour and you send out the URL. So we wanted it to be super easy to assign, um, which means you don't have to read a 20 page print curriculum to try to figure out what to do. And now for the students, what we wanted them to have is clearly engagement is one of the motivating principles of this year. Students are very disengaged from school, generally speaking. So that was clearly important. And the stories are so beautiful and so touching that we knew that the Girl Rising materials, just to get them into the classroom easily for students would be a very engaging experience. And then we also wanted to figure out a way that students could connect with students across the globe because we're feeling very disconnected right now. And so we thought, what could we do to bring people together um, as they appreciate these stories? So we, um, we created an online module for students. So for teachers, you just go to the girlrising.org website. And then at the top, if you go to for educators, if you go to this curriculum and tools, which is the second item down from the menu, once you uh, register, fill out your name and email address, how many students you think you'll assign this to and anything else you wanna share and submit it. And then you'll be given uh, the URL to the module. We created several things actually for this. We created uh, an online module that was appropriate for both middle school and high school. And the only difference between the middle school and the high school version is the reading level. The reading level of the middle school is around a fifth grade level. And so if you have elementary school students that are good readers, there's, not, there's no reason that I wouldn't give this to um, a third grade really good reader, and then certainly fourth graders. Um, as long as they're reading well enough, they would not have a problem with the middle school module. And then the high school module is written for an upper eighth, ninth grade, low ninth grade level. So it's very accessible for any high school students. We have two versions of the module. And then we also have an extra um, set of resources called Do More for people who want to explore more. But the the module itself takes roughly an hour to go through and I will show you the high school module. In this first uh, screen, you are introduced to the idea that you're gonna meet two girls in this module. And we wanted to ask students at the very beginning this um, question, what do you think worldwide, how many girls would you estimate don't go to school? So I actually want you to guess the answer as well. Is it 1 million? Is it 5 million? Is it 30 million or is it 130 million? How many girls worldwide do you think are out of school right now? Uh, Sarah and I both asked a lot of people we know, adults, kids, um, and very few people could answer the question correctly. And then we actually asked a few follow-up questions, including, well, how many school-age kids, boys and girls, do you think 
are in school in your country and no one was even able to get somewhat close to the number. So the correct answer, as you have probably guessed, is 130 million. And I'm gonna go ahead and select 130 million and submit my answer. And we wanted to lead with this question as well as unpack the number because big numbers are very, very difficult for students to understand. They have no sense of the scale. Um, for example, in the United States, when we looked it up, there are 50 million boys and girls in school, school aged children. And, and so this number 130 million just girls to a, a kid in the United States, they would think, oh my gosh, that's significantly more than just all the children in our country. So no matter what country you're in, and we looked up the numbers all, all over the world, and it was very interesting. It takes about you know, seven, eight or nine countries added together to come up with 130 million. And those numbers are shocking. So, you know, I would look up your country's population of school aged children just to give students a comparison. If you're in Brazil, Australia, India, Pakistan, wherever you are, find out what that number is and just ask them to compare. Like, does this surprise you that that 130 million girls worldwide are out of school? And how does that compare to the number of kids in our country, period? But we did look up how big is 130 million and it took us a while to come up with the right collection of countries to hit the number 130 but it's all the girls and boys ages 6 to 17 in Brazil, Japan, France, Spain, Germany, Australia and the United States combined. So the next um, thing students get to do is they get to watch uh, one of the Girl Rising stories from the documentary and in this story they meet Wadley um, a child, a seven-year-old girl from Haiti, and she's out of school because of an earthquake. And the story is a beautiful story of hope and what Wadley does to go to school. She, she keeps attending school, even though she's not allowed because her mother doesn't have the tuition, but she keeps going and she lives in a tent city after she's been displaced um, from this earthquake. Another thing we know about children is it's very hard to know where places are. So when you're teaching geography, for example, it's not enough to just say where on the globe is Haiti. You have to be able to say, where is Haiti in relation to where I live? So we embedded this Google map feature and students can click on directions and they can put in where they live and they can find out what does it take for me to get to Haiti from where I live, how far is that? And in this next um, screen in the online journey, uh, students get to meet Suma and Suma's older and Suma is in Nepal, but her parents lacked the money to pay the school fees and um, uh, placed her into domestic servitude, which is called being a Kamlari in Nepal. And um, when we're asking students to watch these, these stories, we do ask them here, as you can see, there's a little pencil icon, jot down any ideas that you wanna use for later because there's a project at the end of this. And so we want them to keep track of what's interesting to them. And there's also, again, a way to find out, well, where is Nepal and where is Nepal in relation to where I live? How far away is it? So again, students can go through this embedded map. But we wanted to show you a five minute clip of Suma's story. We pick up midway through her story. This was the house of my second master. Janak Mala wore a uniform to work. He and the mistress of the house were very hard hearted. Unlucky girl, they used to call me. Hey, unlucky girl, do this, they'd shout. They made me sleep in the goat shed and wear rags and eat scraps from their dirty plates. I can't really talk about everything that happened to me here, but I will never forget. This is where I began to write songs. Only the songs got me through. Swarthi 
दिलुटा छाई हाँ काकर जन्मा दिलुटा छाई हाँ दादू भाईया ने स्कूल में पढ़ना मैं दुखी छाई जिंदर वगर जाइना मारा खाइना कसीन मरी जीवन This was the house of my third master. I was 11 years old when I arrived at Chitai Tharu's house. I had been a Kamlari for five years. It wasn't as bad here. I mean, it was bad because there was a lot of work. But there was a lodger in that house, a school teacher called Bimusur. He changed my life. Bimal sir convinced my master and mistress to enroll me in a night class. All of us would gather after finishing our day's work and we would learn to read and write. I loved that night class so much. It was run by social workers for girls just like me, Kamlaris. We would also talk to the teachers about what it was like to be a Kamlari. And as we talked, we began to realize that bonded labor was, and isn't it, slavery. The teachers who ran the night class began to go from house to house. They wanted to liberate us. One teacher, Sita Didi, told my master that he was breaking the law by keeping me as a Kamlari. She talked about the law against bonded labor, and the law about children's rights, and the law on labor rights, and the law against domestic violence and trafficking. She talked to him about justice and injustice, and she demanded that he set me free. My master said no. Once made, a bond couldn't be broken. Sita Didi didn't give up. She kept arguing. She came back day after day. And in the end, she led me home to my mother and father. I am my own master now. I have no mistress. I was the last bonded worker in my family. After me, everyone will be free. I love all the different themes that come out in that video that students could explore. And while Suma's um, story is is partly one of hardship. It's also one of bravery and fighting for what's right and understanding what justice means and all the support she's being given by other people in her community. And it's a wonderful story for students to understand. So after they explore Suma's story and watch the full video and find out where Nepal is in relation to where they live, they can go to the next screen and now that they've met the two girls and they now know two reasons why two girls out of the 130 million are out of school, 
um, what are all the reasons that girls are out of school? What is what what's the source of this problem? And it and we have to figure out what the stem is. And we tell them that the, the two big stems are poverty and gender discrimination, but we give them a slideshow. And if you've ever worked with children, and I know you all have on computers, they like clicking on things. So instead of just give them a bulleted list, we gave them an interactive slideshow that they could click through to discover why girls are out of school. So one of the reasons families who can't afford to educate all their children will often choose to educate just their sons. Some cultural and religious traditions discourage the education of girls. School is too far away and there's no transportation and the walk can be unsafe for girls. Girls may um, experience gender violence at school and drop out. School isn't always free and some schools require uniforms and the uniforms aren't free. So the financial hardship is there. And all these reasons, by the way, are overlaid on uh, the photography that Girl Rising has amassed. We couldn't believe when we saw the database of photography that Girl Rising, the documentary filmmakers were able to um, achieve from the film shoots. It was wonderful to be able to show more images than what the students are seeing in just the two videos. And sometimes girls have to stay home to care for younger siblings. Uh, water, clean water, the source can be far away and girls are often the ones in charge of fetching the water. Girls who are married off as children don't complete their education. Girls who get pregnant are often not allowed to return to school. Schools sometimes don't have separate bathrooms for girls and boys. Many girls don't have access to menstrual products, so they can't go to school if they have their periods. And there are too few, few female teachers and some families just aren't comfortable sending their girls to school with all male teachers. And some girls have to go to work at a very young age to earn money for their families. So that gives students an overview of all these reasons that they can explore themselves. And then now that they know why girls are out of school, we have an interactive of what changes when girls are educated. And for each reason, students can hover over it and find out more. So they marry later and they get to find out more about what that means. So girls with eight years of education are six times less likely to be married as children. They have fewer children. A girl who receives seven years of education has 2.2 fewer children. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of statistics in here that students could dive into that help them understand uh, these reasons. But um, we tested this with some kids. I actually taught it with some middle school kids and this was a very popular page. Partly they started by spinning the boxes, of course, because that's very fun watching boxes spin. But as they sit there and after they get through their initial, I love spinning boxes, they started reading it and trying to understand, wow, this is, this is important stuff. And, um, and that was a wonderful thing, you know, as an educator for me to see, particularly boys connecting with this idea that they should care about why girls are out of school and how the world becomes a better place when girls are educated. So then we asked a question, who is responsible for advocating that all girls in the world are educated? Is it girls and women? Is it boys and men or is it everyone? And our team sat around and debated this a lot, but we ultimately decided that this question stays. And, and the, the counter argument was you can't ask this question because the answer is obvious. No kid is gonna say just that girls and women are responsible for advocating that girls are educated. But that was the point. We wanted it to be super obvious and we wanted students to be forced to explicitly articulate that everyone is responsible for seeing that girls are educated. So of course they're gonna say everyone. I mean, if they don't, I would be very surprised, but you click everyone and you click on the submit button. And we even say in the answer, uh, this may have felt a bit like a setup. How could you answer anything other than everyone? 
but then we, we give them the reason why everybody is actually responsible for advocating for this. Educating girls profoundly affects how our whole world functions, which means everybody has a responsibility. So this is the call to action for kids. We wanted to activate this idea that I care about this. I was moved by these stories. I was introduced to an issue that I didn't understand before. And now I'm feeling that I have some responsibility to do something. What am I gonna do? So we give them a project to take action and we wanted it to be um, a project that didn't feel like an academic school project. We wanted them to create a meme. Memes are very, very popular with the middle school and high school age children. They um, sometimes they go to websites just to look at tens of dozens of memes a day, just different things that are funny. But we wanted to show them you can actually make a meme and you can do it to um, uh, use your voice to stand up for something that you care about. And you can share your meme with the world and, and put forth an idea about something that means something to you. So the idea is make a meme to share on Instagram or social media. And for students who don't have access to social media, we're recommending that the teachers start maybe a classroom Instagram account that just the classroom uses and they use that account to share and maybe subscribe to other um, people to, to look at on Instagram and that keeps the kids safe. We want the kids to use the hashtag rising to educate girls so that they can see all the memes that students around the world are creating and the hashtag gives you that automatic search. So if you went to Instagram and you typed in this um, hashtag, you would see the memes that students have already created. And we wanted to give them some ideas, you know, a meme isn't just humorous, which is what my teenage boys thought <laughs> when I first started working on this project, when I was asking them, what are memes for? And they said, oh, they're to tell jokes. But then we started digging a little deeper. You can actually, you can inform people. You can inspire people. You can amplify a message that you want to amplify. And we, even though it may seem adults are probably going to be more confused about making memes than um, kids are, but we do offer a how-to video on how to make a meme. And international educators, canva.com, C-A-N-V-A.com that we link to from here, they have a wonderful uh, gift for educators right now, and that is you can get a free classroom account which means you get a code and your kids can use all the professional features in Canva for free. And it's for educators around the world. From the teacher's uh, teacher guide, we provide the link to the register for a free account page in um, Canva, but do it and then give your kids access to a really nice tool to, to make things. And then I also have to say that there is something about learning how to communicate visually and with very succinct writing that is 100% in alignment with your, with your goals and objectives as a, as a teacher. It's just different than writing an academic paper. But we, and then the last page, and then I will show you how to make a meme because if you've never made one, I wanna show you that it's really, really easy. But the last page of the module after they make their meme is what happened to Suma and Wadley? You know, when you see a documentary and you care about the people that you've seen in their stories, you want to know well, what happened next to the story. So Girl Rising has um, filmed follow-up stories for the girls. And here's the follow-up story for Wadley, this video on the left. And the um, follow-up story for Suma is the video on the right. And then there's a little message to students after they finish the model, module, congratulations, you finished. If you want to do more, you can do more and we'll show you what the do more stuff is, but that links right here to more projects that they could take on if they wanted to and you as the educators wanted them um, to do that. But let me show you very quickly how to make a meme. Because again, I promise you it's very, very easy. And uh, it's really not something that you need to um, teach kids how to do. They can figure it out themselves and they should figure it out themselves. You can give them access to the technology tool, certainly, but they can get going with it themselves. All right, so five easy steps 
I made this meme right here on the left. I was very proud of myself. It was my first meme. Um, and it took me, I think, about five minutes to make. It was not hard technically to make. So the first thing you do, as I mentioned, go to canva.com and complete the application to get a free classroom account. That will give you a code that you can give students and it gives them a lot of the premium features that other people pay money for in Canva. And the first step one, select Instagram post. When you log into canva.com with your new free account, Instagram post will just give you the right size of graphic if you didn't want to do this in canva.com and you know your students have access to some kind of graphics editor, you would just make a, a 1080 by 1080 uh, pixel size image. That's all an Instagram post is, but this makes it easier to do it. And then you add an image and it has, they have um, a database of photography that you could use, or you could upload your own image. I loved this image I found in the Girl Rising materials is a girl, little girls wearing a t-shirt that says one girl with courage is a revolution. And I loved the t-shirts. So I wanted to put her in my meme. And then I wanted a background color. So I just filled it in with a red I liked. And then I wanted to put some text on. And so I selected the button to add text and I added the, the text for the, the meme saying, and then I added um, another field of text to include the hashtag. And then after my, my meme was done, I wanted to download it. So I downloaded it to my computer and then we uploaded it to Instagram. But again, if you didn't want your students using personal Instagram accounts or asking them to uh, use a personal Instagram account, they could just send the downloaded file to you. They could email it to you. They could submit it to you via Google Classroom. You could uh, upload all the images yourself to a class Instagram account. Or if you really don't want to fool with social media at all, you could send them out to people in the school, in the school newsletter, or you could send them to the town newspaper. You, you know, you, you would have a collection of images and um, ideas from your students that you could do whatever you wanted to do with them. But we also wanted to show you um, the other projects that are available in Do More. And those projects are really for the kids whose um, curiosity and passion and interest have really been piqued. Uh, you could assign them to work on these projects. And again, we made them very flexible. They are easy enough to figure out that kids could work in a group and work on it themselves. Uh, you wouldn't have to necessarily facilitate the whole thing because all the directions are very, very clear in the project. But we would love to show you the do more things. Sari, do you want to share? Or do you yes, want me so to I'm going out. Hi, everyone. So I am going to share my screen. And if we went back to the home page, you could see at the end of the module, Stacy showed you there was a button for do more, but it's also here on the home page. Um, I did also want to point out that on the home page, there is a teacher's guide for all of this. So uh, do more. The first thing is that there are nine um, girls whose stories they filmed around the world, and we've only shown you a couple of them. And so you do have access here uh, to more videos. So students, if they just want to see videos of more of the girls, they can just go watch them. The difference here between middle school and high school is that there are a couple of stories that we feel of the additional videos content wise aren't as appropriate for younger students. There is a story of a, a, a girl uh, in Egypt who was sexually assaulted. So we have curated these in terms of the appropriateness of the content um, by the age group. But then we have these three more uh, do more projects for middle and high school. So they really approach these projects with three completely different ways for kids who are more interested or if you as the educator is more interested. So the first is, what about my country? And, you know, we thought there are um, students who will be uh, involved in this project who are in countries where they might be aware of obstacles or challenges to education, but there might be students in other countries who think, oh, everybody in my country gets to go to school. There are no obstacles. And yet every country has some obstacles for some students. So this is a research project where we ask students 
um, to research information and we, um, we give them tips on how to search online, um, where to search, also some international websites that have information about students. And we wanna find out what are the barriers to education in your country. You could also choose for your province or your region or your state. Um, and then we want them to share their research. So we give them an example, a list of examples so that you could write a report, they could make a slide deck, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, write a letter to the editor, um, here again, there is a link out to Canva. And this is an example that um, we made uh, since Stacy and I are in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which is what the state of Massachusetts is called in the United States. Um, we looked up the statistics for the high school dropout rate, which is one of the issues with education in the United States. And I know this is maybe a little uh, small can get this a little bigger for a moment. Um, and then just made a bar graph showing this is the dropout rate for all students, for girls and boys, but then showing that, um, that it's really economic issues and also students with disabilities have much higher dropout rates than sort of the general dropout rate. And this is an opportunity students to research, present, and then start conversations about what does that mean um, for these students. And I want to interrupt just a sure. bit. This is an opportunity for math teachers. You know, the yes. ability to uh, visualize data in a meaningful way, that's a standard thing that math teachers try to teach. And it could also be a really great history project, just the researching of the information and creating a way to graphically represent that. It's such a great point. And um, in even just interpreting publicly available statistics, is a really um, important lesson on the real world application of math and understanding math as a citizen, um, how to use that information. So the second project is more of a personal and creative project called What's Your Story? Because we've seen the stories of a couple of girls and we also, I should have pointed out, we um, had another video that we suggested students watch before they do the research into their own country. And in this one, we recommend another story, which is Senna from Peru. And um, Senna, um, she uh, discovers a poem that really speaks to her and encourages her to write poetry and really find her voice in a very real way. Um, we wanted, I should back up, we wanted in the module to have a really easy to do project, which is to make the meme, something that you could get in and out of this one hour module, but we wanted to also have students have the opportunity to go deeper. And one of the things that we really felt was so important about these videos is to get students wherever they live to think more deeply about their own education. What does their education mean to them? What does the education mean in the legacy of their families? Um, what did their parents have an opportunity to be educated? Did their grandparents, what does it mean uh, across a family and generations to have an education? And I'm just gonna jump down here for a second to point out that Girl Rising this year in 2020 had a storytelling challenge to have people around the globe write about um, what they're uh, doing to create a more just and equal world. And so down here, we have examples for students, how other people have you know, expressed themselves. So we have actually Suma's song um, in the Suma video, she sings and we have the lyrics for this. There are poems, video art and essays. And so for this is a pretty straightforward project. We, um, have some prompts for brainstorming to get uh, students to think more deeply, to go beyond the surface of how they think about the education, their education. And we also remind them that when you write or talk about yourself, um, that readers don't always know who you are unless you tell them. I, uh, I teach memoir writing and I do find people when they talk about themselves, sort of assume, sort of have assumptions about who they are that never gets expressed. So we say to them, um, make sure that people know who you are, what's unique about you, and what matters to you. And then we give them some guidance on how to create their project, whether it's an essay or a piece of art. 
And one of the things we think is really important when you share a personal story is that you're specific to yourself and not just generalize it. So we give an example so students understand that. So generalize would, would be saying some people say that when a girl goes to college, she inspires other girls to go to college. But specific would be talking about your own story. And we know that whether it's through writing or art, that it's specificity really is what creates connection more than generalization. And so that's our second project. Now our third project is the most involved project and actually um, is a team project, which can be done with an entire classroom or uh, several different teams in your class. And this is the Be the Change Makers. And this is where we're saying to students, if you're seeing these issues about education and you're moved by them, we want to show you how you can make real change in your community. So again, we have another story um, that you can watch. Um, and in this story, what's really important is that you see um, uh, Marima's story from Sierra Leone is that she keeps facing all these obstacles and she sees every one of them as a problem to be solved. She, she looks at them as something positive, like, oh, this is in front of me. How do I solve that problem? How do I solve that problem? It's an amazing model for students. So this is a much more involved project in which what we ask students to do um, is to identify um, challenges for students to get an education in their community. And it might not be the challenges that all students face, but the challenges that some students face. So we want them to identify challenges, brainstorm solutions, research how they can make their solutions active, and then share that entire um, project with the community. So this is a real project to look for issues in your community and then find solutions and share them. So I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because there's a lot, but we talk about first, read the whole project, plan your collaboration. We share a, a collaboration project management tool. We list all the roles in the team so that the classroom people can be assigned roles. Um, we then have them identify the problem by interviewing people in their community that are responsible for the school system where they live. And we give them uh, guidance on how to conduct interviews, um, what they should be uh, asking, even just um, ideas on what some of these obstacles might be. And we have a tip here about how they can share responsibilities during interviews to make sure the interviews are recorded. Then the team will brainstorm solutions to the problems they've identified. And we have tips for running a brainstorming session. Then you can come up with ideas, but we're saying to students, we actually believe in your ability to do authentic, meaningful work in your community. This is not just like, let's come up with a, a bunch of great ideas and then like go out for ice cream. So, um, we want them, once they come up with ideas, to research how these ideas can be implemented. So we give a couple of examples. So it may be that there's, you find out that students in your schools can't, some students can't afford the school materials that they need. So they could research potential sources of funding within your community to help buy materials for students. It could be that there are students, this is a huge issue with COVID, that there are students that don't have reliable internet access at home. This has become an enormous problem for, for children who are remote learning now, but there are communities that have found ways for students to get access to the internet. So if your community hasn't done that, students could research that and then actually present that to um, people in power in their community to help those students get access. And then the final piece is sharing this entire project. And we want them to, um, as a team, think about what they want to communicate, who their audience is, who can help them make change. Is it students at the school? Is it elected officials? And how can they share their information? And so we give a long list based on what they're sharing and who their audience is about what they could do. So they could write an article for the student newspaper, or they could write a letter to the editor of the actual local paper. They could do a presentation at a school board meeting. 
they could do an art exhibit. We want students to know that they actually do have the opportunity to create real change in their communities. And obviously of the three projects, this one does require the most facilitation from uh, teachers. We trust that uh, educators know, you know what their students are capable of. And this is a really in-depth project that we think could be incredibly rewarding. And Sarah, I mean, we've t- I know we talked about this a lot, but what an incredible skill to give students yeah. to develop their agency that they can yeah. email people and ask for an interview and record the interview and transcribe it and um, figure out what they learned from the interview, talk to their team. What did we, how do we put this together? The, again, engagement through meaning, we're making meaning and the students are creating the meaning and they're figuring out what's important to them. And you know what, it could be that what they learn, some of the students, some of the students might get really passionate about what it means to educate girls. Other students might uh, see this and think about um, autistic children in their community and and how they're being educated. Who who knows what they're going to connect to, but I do think that you see in these stories that the girls, again, they, they have a problem, they tackle their problem, and that at the most generalizable level, what does it mean to overcome obstacles in our lives and how do we make changes for good? And um, I, I think it will be good opportunities for the kids to do this kind of work independently. And Stacy, should I quickly show the teacher yeah, show guide? The teacher's guide? Yeah, so here's the teacher guide. And as Stacy said from the outset, we know that you, you all who are educators are really overwhelmed now. So we tried to make this a very concise, straightforward teacher's guide. Um, we talk about how the original model that Stacy showed is student facing so that students can mostly do that on their own. Um, we talk about give opportunities for facilitating. There's the information right here about registering. And um, and it's actually not so long, like we mostly it's like extra information you might want. And then at the end for uh, educators from the United States, we've included the Common Core standards. Um, and the technology standards. And the technology standards. And, and that's there are what- several discussion questions. So if you did want to do facilitation, so for example, my teenage boys are doing remote learning. That's what their school decided. And they meet in video conferencing, Google Meet at multiple times during the day. But in between those times, uh, at least the way our school structured it, they do asynchronous work. So for example, the, as- the asynchronous work could be, I want you to watch these two videos or complete these screens of the module. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about what we learned from the stories. And so we've given you just a few discussion questions that we think are particularly generative. But I want to go back to that original idea we had about engagement. The, the literature of how you engage people, it's not bells and whistles and fancy flip cards and buttons to click. You know, you can certainly initially capture someone's attention with those little tricks and, you know, we all do it. But the way you really develop deep engagement is you figure out how to give someone something to care about. And these stories we feel are uh, very meaningful and we think the kids will care about them. The students will care about them. And the projects are a way just to deepen Um, how they can find meaning in the world. And again, that goes, it just goes to engagement and and anything we can do to keep engagement high and continue to drive research and critical thinking and writing skills and all the things we're trying to teach, but use highly captivating materials. Um, We hope that you'll try using this and that your students will um, connect with these stories.